For those days will be a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of creation in which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he has shortened the days. 24 to 27. But in the, the, those days after the, that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. We're talking about demonic forces. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth, glory to God, the angels, and they will gather the elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the heaven, or from the far end of the earth into the farthest end of the heaven. Hallelujah. In verse 31, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. I just want to point out to you tonight that we need to be joyous, we need to be triumphant and victorious by the blood of Jesus, and we also need to be aware of the fact, I'm, I'm preaching like once a year on this, right? I don't talk about it. I know there's churches where you can hear, this is the end day times, repent, and negative, you know, sounds negative all the time. But I think sometimes when we have a message like this morning where it says we need to draw close to God even more than we can draw close to God, you think, well, is that too heavy? No, not in the light of the times that we're living in. Jesus said, I'm not impressed by the edifice at all. Brand new, you may think it is. I'm impressed by what's going to come upon. Hallelujah. Yeah. Jesus was not impressed by their religious system, their grand buildings. He wasn't intimidated by Herod. He stood before the king the day before he died, or the day he died, and the king talked to him and he didn't say a word because he didn't think the man deserved a response. He wasn't intimidated by anybody. Jesus looked at Jerusalem, and it says he wept because he knew they were asking for the judgment of God. Now, I want to read this to you, and I want to explain why I felt like this sermon was appropriate. Because I am a positive person. You know, I'm happy. We're winning. This is awesome. And we need to be so serious about God. You understand? We need to want more of the glory of God in our lives next year because we're going to need more protection next year than we needed this. Is that far? Are you following? Amen. Now look at what Jesus did the very day. You can't impress Jesus. I was talking this morning about how we get impressed by a movie star. I'm not trying to put anybody down, but Jesus is as impressed by the little person that lives in the house next to you as he is by the most famous person on earth. He paid the same blood for them. Yeah. We shouldn't be impressed by movie stars. The Lord is not. The Lord is impressed with the Father. He's impressed with his bride. He's, he's, he only hurts for the lost. He's not impressed by the lost. Does that make sense? Yeah. Look at what happened in Luke. If Jesus was going to be impressed by anything, in verse 37, this is, if you'll see where we are, right on the triumphal entry. As soon as he was approaching there to descend of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice. For all the miracles which they had seen. And you would think Jesus would be so ecstatic. I mean, here he is. People praising him. Right? But look a couple verses, four verses later in verse 41. Look what he does when he approached Jerusalem. He didn't order. What do you get bubbly without alcohol or something? You know, let's celebrate. He didn't do that. He, he wept. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. And he said, if you had known in this day, even you, the things that make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone on another because you didn't recognize the time of your visitation. He said, God walked among you. And in a few days, you'll yell, crucify him. And they said, what did he, Pilate said, what will I do with Jesus of Nazareth? He said, my, I wash my hands of his blood. And they said, that's all right. His blood be on us and our children. And they call vehemently for a curse upon their generations to come. Oh, how heartbreaking he cried. Now, if Jesus had been wowed by the praise of men, he would have celebrated that day. But instead, he looked ahead and saw the judgment of God and wept. You say, Pastor, why are you trying to bring us down? We got you so happy here. We just need to be aware of the fact that we're living in momentous days. Yeah. We're living in days when we need to take our relationship with God really, really seriously. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. I guess I said that this morning. That's true. 
If Jesus showed up for a visit tomorrow morning at your house, where would we take him to impress him? Would we take him to our prestigious institutions of learning to try to, to try to prove, excuse me, would we take him to this big college where they're trying day and night to prove that he didn't create us, that we evolved? This afternoon when I went home, I went to check my email, I saw a really cool video of a mammoth squid that they have never, ever photographed. They knew it was down the people seen and they never photographed it. It is two stories high. They got cool pictures. Now, you know these scientists are impressed with their knowledge, but would these scientists impress him with their knowledge? He conceived the giant squid and created him. I'm just saying this. When we're, create, when we're all going around drooling over, I, I think Twitter is the stupidest thing in the whole world. I just want to tell you. You can make a fool of yourself and ruin your reputation on Twitter faster than any other way. How can you... You know, your reputation is something built up over however many years you've lived, and you can squander the whole thing with one dumb tweet. Now, if you want to, if you want to tweet, tweet, but think before you tweet. Agree? All right. Would we take Jesus to an NBA court and just wow him with the way the ball goes through the hoop? LeBron James would not wow Jesus. You say, don't you like LeBron? I don't know his name except that I know he came from Cleveland, not from Ohio, so I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. And you say, who are you going to be impressed with? Well, I got a few pastors to impress me. I'm a little bit impressed with Mark, Mark Hankins. Because the anointing on his life helped me at the hardest time in my life when my husband died. But I'll tell you, even Mark's not real impressed with Mark. Do you know who Mark's impressed with? Jesus. If you can get a group of people truly and completely, deeply impressed with Jesus Christ that walk in the fear of him and give him all the glory, God will move in that place. Hallelujah. We can't take him to the NBA court. And we can't take him to the Hollywood film lots where men are doing and filming unmentionable things and then they call it art. And you say, whoa, how dare you? How dare they're doing stuff with other people's wives they shouldn't be doing. And then they say, well, it's just a movie. We're pretending. You're not pretending. You're doing it. I was so heartbroken when I first saw, what is the Kirk Cameron's movie on? Is it Courageous on the Marriage? Awesome. I thought he was kissing. What? Fireproof. Thank you. I got to do I'm not. You say, you don't know nothing about movies, no. <laughs> I'll tell you why part of it is. I love my husband. You know how much I love my husband, but he grew up in the shadow of Hollywood. And he was always a little bit more impressed with that whole scene out there than I was. And you say, what difference does it make all the difference in the world? I don't want to be impressed by any actor or any actress. They give me, they give me an autograph, that's okay, but you're just people, God. Yeah. Yeah. You're a sinner that needs a savior, and I'm here to reach you, not to be impressed by you. If I worship you, I will get you saved. Okay, we're, okay, here's the deal. Fireproof, awesome movie on marriage. And at the end, he really kisses this girl. This is no theater kiss where you hold. And I was devastated. I thought, he would have had no kiss an actress. This is not married to him. Then I found out that his wife was in that last scene. They let her, oh, thank you. You say, it doesn't matter. Sure, it matters. It matters. We're not about pretending here. We're about reality and holiness is holy and unholiness is unholy. And in these last days, there will be a pure church that carries the very power of the living God. Amen. I wouldn't go to a movie where the people took their clothes off. Why? Because God is against nudity. That's why he told us to put clothes on. And you say, well, it's just art. No, it's not art. It's nudity. Yeah. Immorality is immorality. And until you take that stand and say, I will be holy before God, you can't ever draw near enough to him to get your miracle. But if you decide, I won't watch a movie. I mean, I thank God for kids in mind. You can get on there and find out exactly what happens in a movie before you put that chunk into your spirit. Thank God for that website. If it weren't for kids in mind, I wouldn't watch a movie on the planet. Because I don't want to take the risk. You say, are you that vulnerable? No, I want to be that holy. I want to be so close to God that he's not offended by anything in me or anything I think. I know that everything I put in my eyes, I put in God.
God's life because God is in me. We live together. We walk together. I don't want to hear a movie that takes in vain the name of the only one who could ever have saved me. And who paid the highest price possible for me to be with him in eternity. And I want to hear the name of Jesus Christ used as a cuss word. No way. If you're going to do that, you can just keep, keep your money. I'm not giving you mine. Who are the stars? Daniel 12 tells us who the stars are. Did you know that God has a definition of who the stars are? And, you know, I can name you a lot of people who aren't listed in his stars. I hope they get saved and become it. Look at what it says. Speaking of the last time, Daniel writes, Now, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is not written in the book, will be rescued. Verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. If you say God has no stars, that's not exactly right. The ones who God acknowledges the stars of those who lead many to righteousness. We're going to read in a minute a vision that Brother Hagin had. And in that vision, well, I was reading to you, but anyhow, he shows himself in his crown. I and he said, would you want to be a star for God? Yeah, I'd like to be. Soul winning has never actually been my main ministry. Teaching is my ministry. But I'm praying that I'll become more of a soul winner in the next few years than I've ever been because there's no greater honor on this earth. To be a midwife that watches babies come into the kingdom. In, 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 let's look at this. Do you remember that place where Daniel and his friends are going to be put to death because Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream and can't remember it? And then in the dream, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel gets shown the dream. Do you mind reading a little bit more scripture? You see, these are scripture. Oh, by the way, we have to read one other one in Isaiah. Do you know who is called the star of the morning? Lucifer? But he used to be. Not anymore. This is so many. Look at uh, Isaiah 14, 12 to 17. Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, O son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to shale to the recesses of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you, they will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? who made the world like the wilderness and overthrew its cities and did not allow his prisoners to go home. You know, people get so wowed over the devil. Do you know how big and bad the devil is? The, the devil is defeated. And all he can do is lie to you right now. But he is really good at lying. So he, he, he'll, every day, he'll try to get you in a ditch. He'll either come around and tell you, you're probably the smartest person that ever lived. I mean, you're God's gift to mankind, or womankind. He, how many people here have a problem with pride? If you don't raise your hand, I'm going to come on over and just pray. Do you know why? Because that's Lucifer's original sin. And as long as we're, when we're in the presence of God up there in heaven, we will not have a problem with pride. Do you know why? Because we will have a total revelation of who our Father is and who we are. But we're going to be so glad to be there. Pride will not be an issue. We will be amazed we made it. Even with the blood of Jesus, we'll be amazed that he made us that open. Yeah. And pride won't be an issue. But when you're here, you better hate pride with everything in you. When he tells you the most glamorous thing on earth, you spit in his face. When he says you're more handsome than Rock Hudson ever was, spit in his face. You're good looking, but that's enough, all right? <laughs> and he said, why is it? Because oh, we want to walk with God. To walk with God, you've got to walk in humility and you've got to walk in holiness. Um, I don't want to leave out enough, I want to leave enough time for one brother, for Brother Higgins book, but the, the story, do you remember what happens with the statue, he sees 
the, the head of gold and then the shoulders of silver and then the, the torso of bronze and then the feet of clay and steel and then he, or steel and iron, or clay and iron mixed. And then he sees a rock come down from a mountain and it obliterates the whole statue. Let's read the interpretation, okay? Let's go skip the first part there and go down to verse 40. And he's, he's at the, he's explained what the first three kingdoms are. Now he's on the fourth kingdom. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. This is the Roman Empire. Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron, and as much as you saw the iron mixed with the common clay. And as the toes were partly of iron, partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and parts brittle. This is all the Roman Empire. And then let's skip to the next verse. The next verse is the important one. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. He's talking about the stone that came down and obliterated the rest of the statue. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Now, and in as much as you saw, this is the important part, that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. That's the, the kingdom of God. And it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is trustworthy in its interpretation. The, the dream is true in its interpretation, trustworthy. So this is exciting. We are living in the days when the kingdom of God is going to come and take over all the kingdoms of the earth. How beautiful is that? The trouble is the crushing of the other kingdoms isn't going to be pretty. And you say, Pastor, we don't want to hear about this. <coughs> I don't think Jesus wanted to talk about Jerusalem being destroyed. But he was out, the, out of his control. All right? Look at what it says in Hebrews. It talks again about these it says, his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised just once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This is the demonic powers over us. This expression yet once more denotes the removing of those things that can be shaken as of created things, so that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Everything is going to be shaken but the kingdom. Whatever in your life is not of the kingdom will be shaken. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. I want to read you a little bit from Dan Hagen's book, but I want to explain again. The reason I want to talk about it tonight isn't that I don't want to be a positive preacher. I am a positive preacher. I believe that the coming days are going to be some of the most glorious the church has ever, ever seen. But we're going to see the miracles we've always wanted to see. We're going to see the salvations. We're going to see the glory of God on the church. But at the same time, the glories on the church, what's happening to the world? The kingdom is shattering nations. Now, this is from Brother Higgins' book, I Believe in Visions. It's an excellent book. And it talks about a vision he had many years ago in the early 50s. And at the time of this experience, I was conducting a 10th revival in Rockwall, Texas, during the part of August and the first part of September of 1950. On Saturday, September 2nd, it rained all day. He didn't remember every day of his life. Not a hard driving lane, but a slow, gentle rain, and it was still raining at church time, and when we arrived at the tent, only about 40 people were there. Rockland, Rockwall is in the Blackland in North Central Texas, and there's a saying that if you'll stick with the Blackland when it's dry, it'll stick with you when it's wet. Many of the people lived on unpaved roads and couldn't get to service because of the rain and the mud, so we had a small crowd. Since everybody was a Christian, I gave a Bible lesson and then invited the people to come front to pray. It was about 9.30, and I want to say that I no more expected what was to follow than I expected to be the first man to land on the moon. I had been doing any unusual prayer fasting. In fact, I had been praying I'd have such experience. It never occurred to me such a thing. Everybody was praying around the front, and I knelt on the platform beside a folding chair near the pulpit. I began to pray in other tongues in the spirit, and I heard a voice say, come up hither. At first, I didn't realize the voice was speaking to me, and I thought everybody heard it. Come up hither, the voice said. Then I looked and I saw Jesus standing about the top of the tent where, where standing about where the top of the tent would be. As I looked up again, the tent had disappeared, the folding chairs had disappeared, every tent pole had disappeared, the pulpit had disappeared, and God permitted me to look into the spirit realm. Jesus was standing there, and as I stood in his presence, he was holding a crown in his hands. This crown was so extraordinarily beautiful that human language cannot begin to describe it. Jesus said, this is a soul winner's crown. 
My people are so careless and indifferent. This crown is for every one of my children. I speak and say, go speak to this one or pray for that one, but my people are so busy. They put it off and souls are lost because they don't obey me. When Jesus says that, I wept before him. I knelt down and repented of my failures. And then Jesus said to me again, come up hither. And it seemed to me as if I went with him through the air until we came to a beautiful city. We did not actually go into the city, but we beheld it at close range as one might go up on a mountain and look down on a city in the valley. Its beauty was beyond words. Jesus said that people selfishly say they're ready for heaven. They talk about their mansions and the glories of heaven, while many around them live in darkness and hopelessness. Jesus said I should share my hope with them and invite them to come to heaven with me. Then Jesus turned to me and said, now let's go down to hell. We came back down out of heaven and we got, when we got to earth, we didn't stop, it kept going. Numerous scriptures in the Bible refer to hell as being beneath us. For example, <coughs> Isaiah 14, 9, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. Thou shalt be brought down to hell. In Isaiah 5, therefore hell hath enlarged herself and shall, he shall descend into it. We went down to hell, and as we went into that place, I saw what appeared to be human beings wrapped in flames. I said, Lord, this looks just like it did when I died and came to this place on April 22nd, 1933. You spoke, and I came back out of here, and I repented and prayed, seeking your forgiveness. You saved me. Only now I feel so different. I am neither afraid nor horrified as I was then. Jesus told me, warn men and women about this place. And I cried out with tears that I would. He then brought me back to earth and I became aware of the fact that I was still kneeling on the platform by the folding chair and Jesus was standing by my side. As he stood there, he talked to me about my ministry. He told me some things in general that he later explained in more detail in another vision. Then Jesus disappeared and I realized I was still kneeling on the platform and I could hear people praying all around me. And about that time, the Holy Spirit came upon me again. And it seemed as if a wind were blowing on, my, on me and I fell flat on my face on the platform. As I lay there under the power of God, it seemed as if I were standing on a high plane somewhere in space and I could see for miles and miles around me, just as one can stand on the great plains of the United States and gaze off into the distance for miles. I looked in every direction, but I couldn't see a sign of life anywhere. There were no trees or grass, no flowers or vegetation of any kind. There were no birds or animals, and I felt so lonely. I was not conscious of my earthly surroundings. As I looked to the west, I saw what appeared to be a tiny dot on the horizon. It was the only moving thing I could see. As I watched, it grew larger and came toward me, taking on shape and form. And soon I could see it was a horse. <coughs> As it came closer, I could see a man upon the horse, and he was riding toward me at full speed. As he approached, I could see he held the reins of the horse's bridle in his right hand and in his left hand, high above his head, a scroll of paper. When the horseman came to me, he pulled on the reins and stopped, and I stood on his right, and he passed the scroll from his left hand to his right hand and handed it to me. And as I unrolled the scroll, which was a roll of paper about 12 or 14 inches long, he said, take and read. And at the top of the page in big bold black print were the words, war and destruction, and I was struck dumb. He laid his right hand on my head and said, In the name of Jesus Christ, read. And I began to read what was written on the paper, and as the words instructed me, I looked and saw what I had just read. First, I read about thousands upon thousands of men in uniform, and then I looked and saw these men marching, wave after wave of soldiers marching to war. I looked in the direction they were going, and as far as I could see, there were thousands of men marching. I turned to the read the scroll again and then looked and saw what I had just read. I saw many women, old women with snowy white hair, middle-aged women, young women, teenagers, some of the younger ones held babies, and all of the women were bowed down in sorrow, weeping profusely, and those who did not carry babies held their hands on their stomachs as they bowed over and wept, and tears flowed from their eyes like water. I looked at the scroll and again I looked to see what I had read about and I saw the skyline of a large city. Looking closer, I saw the skyscrapers burn out as burn out poles. Portions of the cities lay in ruins. It was not written that just one city would be destroyed, burned, and in ruins, but that there would be many such cities. Uh, the, America's last call. The scroll was written in the first person. It seemed as if Jesus were speaking. I read, "America is receiving her last call. Some nations have already received their last call and will never receive another." 
and then in larger print it said the time of the end of all things is at hand. The statement was repeated four or five times, and Jesus also said this was the last great revival. He went on to say, all the gifts of the Spirit will be in operation in the church in these last days, and the church will do greater things than the early church did. It will have greater power, signs, and wonders than was recorded in the book of Acts. He said, we have seen and experienced many healings, but we will behold amazing healings that have not been seen before. Jesus continued, more and more miracles will be, will be performed in the last days that are just ahead, for it is time for the gift of the working of miracles to be in prominence. We have entered into the era of the miraculous. Then he said, many of my own people will not accept the moving of, the spirit, of my spirit and will turn back and not be ready to meet me at my coming. Many will be deceived by false prophets and miracles of satan satanic origin. But follow the word of God, the spirit of God in me, and you will not be deceived. I am gathering my own together, and I am preparing them, for the time is short. There, will several, there were several other exhortations to watchfulness, to awaken and pray and not be deceived. And then I read, as it was in the days of Noah, so also it shall be in the days of the Son of Man. As I spoke to Noah for seven days, and I will cause rain in 40, upon the earth forty days and nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. So today I am speaking and giving America her last warning and call to repentance. At the time of this vision, naturally, I attributed the scenes to me type things, and he's think, saying some of the things that might have already been. I don't know. I just know this. I know that the part of this man's teaching that I followed would work for me. I know that what I've shared with you, I've learned from him. It works. It's true. I also know that this man was the most positive person I have ever sat under in my life. He loved God. On the day of 9-11, emails started flying. September 11, 2001, emails started flying among the brain of rats and pastors. Saying, don't you remember what Brother Hagin saw about the skyscrapers? I didn't remember. You know why? I read the book, and I read the part that I liked and seemed to apply to me. He said, are you believing for this? No, I'm not believing for this. I'm believing that American Christians may be able to change some of this. But, but if, you see, this man is not a, isn't, he's changed the body of Christ as much as anybody I know. Who do you like to listen to? They were affected by Brother Kenneth E. Hagin and his sweet spirit of love. He didn't write this because he wanted to. He wrote this because America has become so sinful that if we don't see a massive revival, a judgment has to happen, just like it had to happen in Jerusalem. And he said, why are you sharing? Because I truly believe that if there are churches across America that seek God and love God with all of their hearts, like we love God and keep pressing, we're going to be able to change this. We're going to see a revival. And at the very least, we can have a group of people and our young people can carry the glory on them to where I don't care what we go through. The glory of God, if, if he could protect Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace, he can protect us no matter what. But if this is true, then we need, and he said, well, all you have is the book, not the Bible. I have the Bible right here. And Dave spent many minutes putting it in. It's in the book of Revelation. A lot of, say, I don't want to hear this. It's like this. I can read you tons of scripture, how we have joy inexpressible and full of glory. But I can also read you one scripture after another. Can you pull up that scripture in 1 Peter? I have one scripture after another where it warns us to be very sober and vigilant in these last days. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And I want to preach like this all the time, but at least once a year, we got to realize, listen, you can't take God too serious. Amen. Especially right now. Do you understand? Peter wrote this. He said, it is time for judgment to begin where? In the household of God. That's why we want to let our lives be right out in the open where he can, he can correct us, right? For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty, what? We just think we're so lovely, we get saved easy. Are you kidding me? Do you know how holy God is? When you get there, you're going to be amazed you made it. You know why? Because you're just not that sharp. Nor am I. If it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? 
Maybe tonight's message is, how can we impress Jesus? And I can tell you a whole lot of ways of our culture we're not impressing. This need for vast stuff. Did you know what he said is impressed by? He's impressed by those who have compassion for the lost. The greatest asset you have in your life, period, is the revelation you have about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When, Pete, when Jesus said to Peter, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Your revelation of Jesus Christ as the Lord in heaven and earth came to you straight from the Father. You can't get it any other place. The preacher might have preached it, but you had to receive it. And I'm telling you that your revelation of what you know about God is the most precious thing in your life. Without it, you're lost. And you say, well, what are, what are we talking about tonight? I was just frustrated this morning when I said, to get a miracle, you have to draw near. And we think, oh, yeah, we're near. Do you know we could be near? Do God wants a people that is so disturbed that so many people are going to hell when they're already paid for. That that's what they live for. We live. I make every decision for this church. How can we get the most people to heaven? If I see something that I think could, I mean, I do everything I can to try to keep our witness straight and our integrity straight that will not cause one person to stumble. Amen. I have half an hour of, of scriptures. Zechariah 14, it says there's coming a day when Jesus will, his book will come down. I, I'm not a, I am not a prophecy scholar. And I am not at all convinced that anybody's got the whole thing figured out as well as someone will claim. But Zechariah, this is a chapter, I can read it, if you can read, you can understand this chapter, all right? Are you okay with the fact that God wrote the Bible and what it, whatever it says here is really going to happen? It's really good news for us, and it's also very sobering for everybody that doesn't know Jesus. Let's read this one chapter. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, that's right near the temple, looking down on the temple in Jerusalem, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a large valley, so that the half of the mountain will move toward the north and half toward the south. And in that day there will be no light, the luminaries will dwindle. For it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at the evening time there will be light, because the Lord's our light. And in that day living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, that's the Dead Sea, and the other half toward the western sea, that's what they call the Mediterranean. And it will be in summer as well as winter, and otherwise Israel won't be a desert anymore. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And in that day, the Lord will be the only one in his name, <coughs> the only one. Now this will be the plague which the Lord will strike all the peoples who have gone out to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. You say, Pastor, I don't want to read this. I don't read it to you over once a year. But I could be reading you scriptures of the judgment that's to come for the next ten services. And it's just never repeat, just read how do you know we need to read all of the Bible? Yeah. Do you know why? Because we lack the, the depth of passion we should have for the lost. It should cause us to be utterly indignant that people are going to hell when they were paid for by the blood. Now this will be the plague which the Lord will strike all the peoples who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongue will rot in their mouth. It sounds like nuclear. It will come about on that day that a great panic from the Lord will fall upon them and they will seize one another's hand and the hand of one will be lifted up against the hand of another. And then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the Lord, the King, the Lord of hosts, to celebrate the Feast of Booths. It will be that whichever the families of the earth does go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And in that day, there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord. And the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. In other words, everybody on earth will serve God. Every cooking pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord of hosts. And all who, 
sacrifice and come and take them and dwell in them. And there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord. In other words, everybody on earth will serve the Lord that day. They say, why would we read these scriptures? Everybody agree that they're in your Bible. You might not have read them. Okay. It's extremely important. You see, we have a culture that has demonic deception all over it. Puffing up things that are nothing. Nothing. It's really nice to have pretty dresses, but pretty dresses won't matter. Amen. And the reason I read this tonight is because I just believe God wants us to draw so close to him and just say, you know what, I'm going to live the glory of God in my life, no matter what it costs. Amen. I'm not going to be impressed with anybody but Jesus. You can be impressed with him all you want, but you know, their autographs are going to burn up in the word of word of words, you know? No matter what they tweet about you, you're not going to make a speck of difference. But when God says, you know what, you're my friend, you're good. You need the glory of God on your life and on your family in these days. And I just think the Lord wants us to just, we should be so grateful. We think we're grateful, please say, you've never been grateful yet. I used to tell my husband when I got pregnant, you think you've been hungry, you have never been hungry. How many ladies know that? I can ignore hunger. I can be hungry and ignore it. But when you're pregnant, you get so hungry, you can't think. Thank you, Tiffany. I've got a witness here. Well, I'm here to tell you, you think you've been grateful for being saved? You've never been grateful yet. You will be grateful beyond all the works in the world. The God of the universe saw you that and invited you in. Somebody prayed. Somebody shared the gospel. And we need to take these things this seriously or we're not going to fulfill the mission of the church. It's terribly important to God that this church fulfills its mission. Yeah. It's terribly important to God that nothing is more important to us than Jesus in fulfilling his call in our lives. We're just going to spend a few minutes right now just worshiping God, coming down to the front and just say, do we not have a bus kids here tonight, do we? We just have a few, right? We can take them. Let's just, we don't want to keep here all night. But you know that there's sometimes you just need to stop and say, Father, I take you really seriously. Yeah. I appreciate you. Who wants to do the music? Nathan, do you? Jeremy, if you want to do some music, let's do um, whatever you have in your heart. But songs that we know, like Hold Me or Change My Heart of God, This Is My Desire. Let's pray. For right now, just play softly. I just think we're supposed to pray a few minutes and thank God for our son.